thing about animators is we like having fun because we like cartoons, studying and stuff like that. So, uh, but we can also be a little bit goofy and weird because we're watching the same thing on loop over and 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 over. So. Anyway, so this is my talk on uh, animation and games and how that can increase user experience and engagement into, into the experience. So a little bit about myself. I, my name is Peter Benoit. Uh, I live in Virginia Beach right now. I work for the Christian Broadcasting Network as a UI designer, uh, but I'm part of the UX team. And if you haven't heard the term UX, that just stands for user experience. And so it's really our job to constantly, with everything we create, think about what is that going to be like for the user, for the player, for the person that's actually going to use it at the end of the day, um, and not necessarily us, the people who are making it. So, um, and so my experience coming into games was I've always loved games, always loved playing them, uh, always wanted to make them, but it seemed like it was a little bit too hard. Uh, so as I studied animation, and that's what my degree is in, um, I was able to meet more people that were actually in the games industry and then learning that there's a little bit of a difference between animation for TV or uh, movies or th something like that compared to game animation. And hey, it has a lot to do with that user experience part. It's really the part that is, it needs to be responsive. It needs to actually be interactive with the user and consider the player uh, and everything that it's doing. So that changes things up a little bit, but ultimately, I named the talk Sparks, Key Poses, and Screen Shake. To kind of summarize, this is a broad overview of what I think are some of the most important fundamentals of, of animation and how they relate to the rest of game uh, design. So whether you're an artist, actually, quick raise of hands, who's an artist in the room today? Any animators, specifically? Or anybody who dabbles in animation? How about programmers? And business? So I tried to do this talk as mu much for everybody as possible, and um, and yeah, so let's, let's get started. So as we enter into the world of animation, let's see, that's how well this goes. Best movie ever. <laughs> Who framed Roger Rabbit? Oh, I, I never wanted to. Peter, when you <laughs> just talk louder. <laughs> All right, so here we are. Games, animation in games. And let's see. There we go. So yeah, a little bit more about, this is the project I'm currently working on with uh, Shara called Closer Than You Know. And this is just a early stages of it, of taking even the beginning stages. So I, I wanted to stress that like, this talk is really for everybody. If you can do stick figures, if you can kind of just make a sequence of images, you're already one step closer to being an animator. Um, so really, this is the beginning of anything that even gets close to doing that. Uh, and then add some color, some cool computer programs, some graph editors, and you can get further into doing more cool stuff than um, adding more effects and things like that. So these are from a trailer I did for the Guardian of Eden a couple years ago that uh, just showcases kind of like my first foray into really doing game animation for games uh, and how to, how to break that down and how to, to work with it. Um, so I gave you guys all little sheets that you could take notes on, the whole inside if you open it up like a folder. I encourage you guys to doodle, take notes. If you're inspired while I'm talking, I will not be offended if you start doodling a sequence of images or little like comic panels or stuff like that. Um, this is really about you guys and how you can think about your games and make them more engaging for the people that, that uh, want to play them. So if you have any questions, uh, I'll 
try to get through this quick so we can get to it at the end. Um, but if, if there's really something that you really feel like you need an answer that would be relevant to the rest of the group, please don't hesitate. You can go ahead and raise your hand and, and I'd love to answer. Mm -hmm. All right, so the first question, we're gonna get a little bit philosophical. What What is game animation for? What What is the question? And so I realize now it kind of goes back on what I just said, but raise your hands if you think you have an answer for this. Does anybody have an idea of what, what do you think game animation is for? How would you answer that question? Animation for games. Animation for games, okay. <laughs> now using the phrase in the definition. Sharon? Make the game more real for the player. Make the game more real? Anybody else? Omar? To give you a sense of what the player is doing and where they are and what is happening. So to orient them to the universe or to whatever that, that digital experience is? To give it a sense of action and characterization. Act, yeah, action, characterization, personality. Yeah, to give them a feeling. So if you notice, a lot of this has a lot to do with the player, right? It has a ton to do with the player. It's really about what they're interpreting, what they're seeing. Um, so as, as this entire talk goes on, I, I want that to kind of be at the center forefront of our minds. And I think uh, if anybody was here for Rand's talk um, the first day of the conference, I think like that that's really a lot of what that is too. Think about what, what message uh, are you trying to say? Who is this for? All right, so you, like you guys said, I, I kind of categorize them into three categories. Number one is feedback, just kind of the showing action, orienting them to the universe, showing, um, but in this example, I think it's Super Mario World, one of my favorite beginning levels, just because it's a, it's a super fun experience. And like all these little numbers kind of just gently floating up and cascading all the way up. Just get, it gives player feedback that they're doing something better and better and better, and then the last one is the big one, red one up. Um, so, and then just the way the shells fall off too. It's like these are super limited tools back at the early history of, of games, and they were still considering how to use animation to implement it into the experience to, to really give feedback to the player to consider what what is the player's experience. So number two, another example from the great Mario's. Uh, I would say just to inform and entertain. I, it took me couple, probably 10 years to realize if you watch this entire uh, opening cinematic, it teaches you pretty much all the fundamentals that you need to know about what you're about to experience. That, like, you see Tiny Mario, he starts as Big Mario, when he gets hit by a shell, he goes to Little Mario. Um, he can jump on a Goomba's head. The, the player can jump on the other players. Just all the little details that are here that are just animation, just the, the code running through a series of, of actions to show the player um, and entertain them at the, at the menu. It, like Shara said, it looks like it's a lot. And that brings us to point number three. It brings life. Having animation to a game, really, the biggest difference between something like a text experience, which is, which is great, it's not saying it, there's anything wrong with it, but it's really asking the user have their animation bring everything to life inside of their head. But if you add animation to something, what's the biggest, this is the same scene pretty much. What's the biggest difference? One of them looks totally alive. One of them looks totally fun. He's running through, things are happening. There's stuff in the environment moving around when he walks through it. That brings life to it, just like we experience. We walk through stuff, things happen. And that's, that's a little, that's a kind of simplified way of adding animation to, to bring life. Another example, even something like a menu. The transition in, this, this is the logo that they had, this is what they wanted to use, and then an animator put it together so it was like that, and it shows the personality, it gives you kind of that feedback, orients you to the universe, shows life about the, the personality of, of what they're going, like, lets them get to know the digital experience you're going to present to them. So, if you are familiar with the academic side of animation, you've probably seen uh, the Illusion of Life by the Disney Animation, the Nine Old Men, uh, Frank Thomas and Ollie Johnson put these together, and they really use it for early Disney films and animation to solve that problem. How do we add life, realistic life, to these fantastic universes that we're creating? Uh, Snow White, Pinocchio, things like that. How do how do we? What are the principles that really underlie uh, this industry? So there's been a long history, and things have kind of changed. The needs and the purpose of what the Disney animators need uh, were a little bit different than, say, 
motion design and, and things like advertising or websites or the, the whole animation for the web, the needs change a little bit. The, the, but the user generally stays the same. It's always oriented to what's best for the user's experience. So I don't want to step on any of their toes or say that any of these are any less valuable. I think they have much more experience than I do. So I even reference these. And so I just took it upon myself to kind of think through and, well, specifically about games, what would a principles of animation for games look like? And so I kind of grouped them together. If you're familiar with the, the 12 principles of animation from the Disney animators, um, or the 10 motion design principles, and there's some other ones out there, kind of summarized them into these cat larger kind of categories. Timing and rhythm, uh, intentionality and purpose, clarity and believability, responsiveness, and style and personality. Uh, and so, just a brief overview. Timing and rhythm is really just the time matters in the animation. The amount of time that you have to do something really determines what you're able to show, what you're able to do. Um, if I were to say, show me a ballet dance, but you only have half a second to do it, what you would probably <coughs> show me is much different than if I said you had five minutes to show me what a ballet dance looks like. There's a lot, there's a, a lot more... Uh, a lot of more variety that you would probably be able to show in the five minute than you would in the one minute. Intentionality and purpose, this kind of goes back to my core theme of it ma the user matters, the person that it's for, the audience, the player. They matter more than anything because that intentionality that you put into that action, don't just make something move for the sake of it moving, have a reason for it. Have some kind of thought process into, oh, I made this bush move because it adds more life to the scene or it feels like the world's alive. Um, yeah, we can all, like, I've stumbled on stuff where it just kind of works, but it's always better, and the user can definitely tell if you do things, intention, have intentionality and have purpose for adding something to a scene. Clarity and believability. Um, this goes more into things like, and I'll go into it later, but like staging. Uh, really thinking about, is, is the action clear? Are things able to be read? Uh, and is, are the physics of that action <coughs> believable? Is it, even though it might be in a crazy fictional universe like Mario, does it still make sense? Is it consistent with all the other things that I've seen up until this point um, so that I can continue to believe in this universe, to continue to, to be invested? Responsiveness, that's the one thing that I think is different than like TV animation or movies. Uh, the animations need to be, you have to consider the player's input. Um, unless they're just going to be watching a very light, interactive movie, uh, if the player needs to be able to do something, it, you, you as the animator or as a game designer need to consider, well, what, what is the experience going to look like if the player is doing an action and they press another button? What, what does that look like? Considering that kind of problem, are they going to stop the animation immediately? Something like the uh, like more arcadey, kind of like Devil May Cry experience <laughs> where you might be pressing the, the gun button and he'll be shooting, you press the sword button and he'll immediately switch to the sword. And that responsiveness uh, just helps the player experience, where something more like um, more weighty might make the player wait. And it, and so it's not always a bad thing. I think the other thing I would say about the whole list is these are a little bit like a thermometer in these categories. It doesn't necessarily say one's good or one's bad, one's hot, one's cold. It's just a matter of have an intentionality for ev for each of these categories of why you're putting it in the game. Uh, and then style and personality, I think, is the is a big thing to just add to that life, add to, hey, there's a human making these for other humans. doesn't necessarily have to just be a very robotic, mechanical kind of experience. Um, so adding some kind of life and some kind of personality can go a long way into making the entire experience more enjoyable and more believable. All right, so I know it hits you with a lot of categories, but we're going back to the beginning. So when I say sparks... In my title, I'm talking about feedback. I'm talking about sparks is a perfect way, one of my favorite ways of showing feedback for something. If you check out this animation from the, the new Dragon Ball Fighter Z game, um, none of us can feel that. But if you look at the way the sparks and all the stuff flying on the screen, that looks super dynamic. It looks like there's something happening, something that really shows some kind of feedback into the power of that kick to Goku, and he flies away. So sparks are, and dust and things like that, just the, the reaction of the digital world to whatever the player is doing, that shows a big part of, of adding life and more interactive elements. And uh, yeah, just 
generally feedback is good to give to the player. So here's an example of using feedback uh, for menus. And so one of the, the principles of like squash and stretch and, and just kind of directing the player's atten attention to things. Um, so sparks might not just be kind of glistening particle effects or anything like that. It, giving feedback is also just showing messages. Um, showing messages in like a cascading sequence of events. And then going more to a character kind of point of view, uh, using squash and stretch to show feedback for what, what changed, what happened in that entire action, what, what's different about it. Here Mario's doing a uppercut, and at the peak of his cut, of his uh, action, you can see his fist is huge. It's almost bigger than his head. And it grows to help draw the player's focus, where it might look kind of silly when you're just looking at it like this, but this is really where it matters for the entire team, is to consider what is the, the composition of the experience going to look like. Because this is from Super Smash Brothers Melee. It's a very fast-paced, action-packed game. When there's a lot of other stuff happening, it helps just draw the focus of like, yes, that happened, and I can focus on something else. The game's running at 30, 60 frames per second, sometimes faster. The, the, the actions happening still need to be clear for the user. So if there's a bunch of other crazy things happening on the screen, I can still tell I hit a button, some, Mario did what I expected them to do, and he goes back so I can hit another button. Uh, next one kind of goes into the principle of squash and stretch and staging and framing, that the silhouettes are really important to what the action is doing. As you see, he, this is one of the signature moves in Smash Brothers, and I, I love Smash Brothers, so I'm going to use a lot of examples from that uh, for the same reason that I think the what I'm talking about, the games being fast-paced. Fighting games are great to study that, that type of thing because they're so fast and they're, so, they're two players that need to know exactly what's going on constantly have that information updated. It's such a fast-paced experience um, and a long history of those kinds of games with like Street Fighter and things like that, that a lot of these really difficult problems have been solved already. And there's a, a long history of people who can um, give information and give answers and insight of how to solve those problems. So back to Mario, he's doing a, he's squashing in to show that he's kind of winding up for a big attack and then he releases the big attack. And you see his entire body kind of goes in and out. And again, in the context of an entire scene, that's a big dramatic change, especially if there's a static <coughs> stage in the background or some more like ambient things happening. That, fee that just feels powerful in the context of everything else, especially if the next part of the feedback, the next part of that feedback loop is a big shock of sparks and another player flying off to the side of the screen. That's all feedback. That all shows you did something, something happened, and it changed the entire situation that you were in before. And now, and there's, here's the update. So going into kind of that, that wind back is another principle of animation, which is anticipation. And how that can be used in gameplay, too. Not just individual animations, but wider scale. So I think if there's another takeaway kind of theme from this talk, it's just using different lens in your process of, of game design, of programming, of animation, or anything like that, to just kind of think if you're super zoomed in, kind of realize that. Um, be aware that you're very zoomed in on the one individual thing that you're working on. And like, hey, I've been, I've been zoomed in. Let me zoom all the way out and think about other ways that this, this same thing that I just did, the same intentionality that I put into this tiny thing, how that factors into, well, what if we did that on a larger scale, in the larger experience? So here's a Jetpack Joyride just showing before this thing is actually active, and this is a classic video game trope at this point, I'm sure you're all familiar with, like the enemy showing that they're about to do something, so you should, you should dodge it, you should not be there. It gives you time to anticipate that there will be danger in that area. So if you are there when these things show up, it gives you time to, to get out of the way. Uh, this player didn't get out of the way. Well, uh, great, uh, there's a video on YouTube by the, uh, uh, what is it called? I'll, I'll think of it later. But, extra credits video where they analyze all the animation and the personality put into these these characters. This is a boxing game, but because it's a boxing game, the anticipation given to these characters, that's where it showcases their personality. That's where you're, you're able to actually see the biggest difference. They're all throwing punches. Mechanically, they're all just going to hit you with a punch, but the biggest difference between this guy and the, like Donkey Kong is the way they act in that anticipation. So adding
adding that kind of stuff can add a totally different personality, totally different life uh, to the entire experience. Speaking of Donkey Kong, uh, here's another way of just inside of an individual action, just breaking down the, the mechanics of it. If you're trying to do something, which in this case is a, he's doing a double-fisted, like, pound downwards, um, the terms animation and follow-through are kind of, in game terms, it's the stuff before the hitbox, before it's actually an active thing that interacts with other stuff in the world, and then follow-through is all the stuff that happens after. So the anticipation here is all those frames of animation where he winds back. And generally, the stronger something is, the more frames of anticipation there will be beforehand. Then there, and then when it flashes red, that's the only point that this hitbox actually does something to the other players in the scene. So all this other animation is just showcasing how strong. And if you're familiar with Smash Brothers, this hits you straight down, which is not, not where you want to be. Uh, same thing with here. I think this one just showed better follow through of just all those frames of the animation after his foot turns red is him just kind of posing and it just shows that like I just did something really strong. So the anticipation's a little bit beforehand is a little bit quicker than say this one, but they're both really strong attacks that do the same thing. So this is that goes more into like use these as what I'm saying as like a stronger. <coughs> it's not necessarily a right or a wrong. Um, or false kind of thing. It's more of the principles there. Are you able to utilize it? And how can you be creative with it and actually consider it uh, when you're designing things for the user? So this is a big thing that I, I don't see, I don't think I see enough of now uh, for the users, especially in the indie game scene, is celebrate why they came to the experience. Add things that that's why they're here. Consider in the general brand of the game that you're making, Add animation that celebrates the user for, for whatever it is that they're there for. So this is Raymond just saying, like, after you do a victory, uh, excuse me, after you complete a level, the, the characters do a high five. There's a little animated celebration. There's flashes. There's sparks. It just makes you feel good. That's why I came to play Raymond. It's a cartoon experience. It's challenging. But at the same time, like, I came to have fun. Another example of fun, Crash Bandicoot, the, the original PlayStation ones. Same thing, even when, even when you're punished, it celebrates the cartooniness, the essence of that experience, of why you came to play Crash Bandicoot. You came for that Looney Tunes experience, and it never lets up. And that, I think that says a lot more than when you just kind of put those overall branding ideas just into like one or two little areas. When you're going all out, when you're giving, it, when you're giving the, what the player expects constantly and turning it up to 11 as much as you can, it's a better experience. And it's memorable. It feels it feels much better. All right. So moving on to the the more clarity, uh, believability, staging. This is an example from Bioshock of if you're the game designer and uh, you have complete control over the player's movement and complete control over the player's camera, it's really easy to stage things. And staging is just a matter of, matter of like imagine you're the the director of a, a theater play in your high school or or whatever. Uh, when you're staging stuff, you're just thinking about, again, what's the audience's point of view, and how can the information that we want to give to the audience, how is that best staged? So here's an example of going into the city uh, where the, the game director, the camera, the, they have complete control. When you start giving stuff up, um, this I couldn't find a, a really good example that was quick and didn't take up a ton of space, but when you give players control of the camera, you still want to show them really important information. So as she's walking across this bridge, what is this game? Monument, Monument Valley. Do you know what type of a game this is? Is this a mobile iOS game? It's a puzzle game. So what's really important to know about puzzles in order to solve them? See all the pieces. See all the pieces. To know the kind of information that you need. So that's why like, as she's walking across, they intentionally put the buttons clear to be able to see. Yeah, that bridge could be on the other side or somewhere else, but uh, like I said, there's, I probably could have picked a better example, but I hope you guys understand that if you're staging things, it just means what's the important things? Thinking through the priority of that scene, what is the most important thing that I need the player to know, that I need the player to remember, and maybe I can stage that in the scene. Journey is another great example. I'm just thinking of this now. That mountain's pretty much constantly somewhere in the scene, so anytime you you turn the camera around, the player is able to freely turn around. 
they always can orient back to, what's my goal? Where am I, where am I actually going? If I go towards that mountain, I will probably be going towards the correct thing that I need to do next. All right, so next big category is key poses. And this goes a little bit more into like what we were talking about with Donkey Kong, the anticipation. This breaks it down even more granular, more finite. Um, here's Link from Smash Brothers Brawl. And he's going through his various key poses. And in between these are fancy name in between frames um, that just kind of fill out these actions. But, and I, I'll have all the resources for this where you, if you guys want to go read these links and, and see the interviews from um, people who have made this. So like uh, Sakurai, who created the uh, Smash Brothers series, has a great interview where I got these frames from where he's talking about when he designs these, he's doing it with a little action figure. And he's, for every character, even Kirby, even Donkey Kong, and he's just putting them in the most clear pose from a singular point of view camera that he can make sure that the user's camera can see clearly what they're doing. So if you see that, he goes from the idle pose immediately into the stance. There's a big dramatic change from his idle pose to the, the stance before an action even takes place. That anticipation, even in a quick move like this where in terms of the actual game speed, this is super slowed down. That attack probably comes out in three frames. Bop, bop, bop. So immediately he pulls his arm back. And just that contrast from this pose to the actual attack, like swing, with the big swipe of the sword blue kind of showing up, um, really, again, like helps the action read, helps it uh, have power. And that's why these things are called key poses. They're the key to the player understanding what's happening, what just happened, to orient them. Where did it come from? Where am I now? And where, where is it going? So yeah, this is, I meant to change frames. But this is a, another breakdown of that. Oh, that, uh, I think it's a Famitsu article where Sakurai breaks down everything about it. And so here's an example of like Fox doing an up smash. The attack doesn't come out until frame five, but he does a big wind up. And then he goes through it. This one takes a little bit longer. And then the follow through is probably the longest thing. So the action happens very fast. But then all the animation afterwards is just kind of, especially in a game like Smash Brothers, where the purpose is people kind of uh, fighting against each other, that this is where you can attack Fox. He can do something. He can put a shield up at this point. He can put a shield up at this point. But at this point, this is where, like, this is the risk, or excuse me, this is where he can actually hit somebody else, and then this is the risk for that super powerful move. So, Staging is not just about the environment, it's about the character silhouettes. I think without being able to see any of the, the, deep, the inner details, um, you can tell pretty much, you can give a pretty detailed description about each of these characters. Just ignore that. I guess that doesn't count as silhouette. Um, but you can give a pretty good detail about their personality, about what they're currently doing, and like what species they are. So silhouettes do a lot, and, and it really matters in a scene, especially when there's a lot of crazy detail going on in the background, to just make things readable, to make sure that the, the player has time to understand. Um, I would go ahead and say, I think game developers are very smart people. Players, I think they're smart too, but it's always good to just like slow things down, show things. Uh, and as long as you're not going crazy too slow, I think generally... We think, we think people, especially as we're looking at it over and over and over and over again, we're building that inward uh, memory about what an action is or what its purpose was or things like that, uh, that we can begin to forget that, hey, the user has none of the context that we have when they're seeing this for the first time. So it's important for, to kind of slow stuff down and make sure that things are as clear as possible, which I could probably take a note for myself and slow down speaking, but I'm trying to, trying to get through this. So yeah, fight, I think fighting games are a perfect example. Again, in the resource slides that I'll, I'll uh, post in the group afterwards. Um, these GDC, this is from a GDC talk where the Street Fighter V um, designer was talking about this. And the pixel era was great at it. It was a fast-paced game. And even though all the characters were super different, they made sure that every time an action was at, like those different stages, the idle, the stance, the attack, excuse me, God bless you and the follow through were super clear. You can tell exactly what's happening. If that's the first, like you blink and open your eyes, you can tell exactly what's happening. Um, yeah, so again, yes. So uh, just to uh, be clear, when you're talking about character silhouette, you're not just talking about like the black versus 
play on the screen. Mm -hmm. You're talking about like the character real estate, where the character is on the screen, and how much. That yeah. So even even these super detailed pixel characters, when I say silhouette, I just mean if you were to draw an outline around them and then fill and kind of mentally fill that in with black, not actually in the game, um, that's the silhouette. That's the thing that's going to be the most clear. And just to act it out real quick, same thing. Like you could tell I'm punching, but if if I was a silhouette and I'm doing this, or I have something like this, like it makes it really hard to tell what I'm doing. Um, if I had more time, I had more like volunteers. That changes when you add layers to the mechanics of an action, like, what is he doing? How does he feel when he's doing that? What's his overall motivation in the scene? Where is he going? What, what is he actually trying to do? Not just for this action, but in general. And are all those things kind of aligned and readable in the pose, in the scene? So yeah, staging going to just, I, I like taking as a mental point to just design for kindergartners, kindergartners and grandparents. If it's readable for them, it's probably going to be really accessible to everybody else. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to dumb everything down. But just ask yourself these kind of questions. At the apex of this action, can you clearly see what the character is doing? Do you under, is, is it really clear to a kindergartner or to your grandparent about what they're doing? Um, and that should be true for as crazy imaginative as your worlds get. If you have the like, crazy RPG where it's like bunny people with axes and all this kind of stuff, I feel like a kindergartner or a grandparent, if the, if the action is clear enough, they should still be able to at least say, oh, he's attacking, or they're talking, or they're thinking, or things, something like that. Um, and so this is where we're going towards the more technical side of, of things. This is more where like the, the interacting with the coding and the, the developers on the team. What state is this attack coming from? What is it considered now? And where is it going to go? Um, and that's not necessarily what the grandparents should know. But in, if they're watching something happen, I think like a button, something super simple, those should be super clear. Your grandparents should be able to know, did I click that button? Did it, was it, was it, un, was it clickable before, when I saw it? Did I click it? Did it do something? Those are those same kind of questions of, of uh, interaction and animation. So here's a follow through and overlap and like, why ninjas wear scars? When an action happens really fast or it's really powerful, uh, it's generally super fast. And it might not be, even to the pers person that has great reaction speed, it might not necessarily be clear. So that's why they, they put very fluid things, like, uh, I don't know, what is, is this called a kimono for what? But like that's why the, these kind of like flow afterwards, and um, the stuff in her hair kind of flows back as well, that like, if you really sit down and kind of analyze, well, one, it looks cool. Two, it, it really looks like a force appeared out of her hand and blew everything back. Um, and this is a great quote from Walt Disney uh, in the Illusion of Life book where he's talking to his team. Hey, guys, things don't all stop at once. Because if, if you're kind of drawing something and it's really easy to think of things very flat and rigid when you're animating because there's a lot to consider. But... If you have something a little bit more fluid on you, that's gonna take a little bit more time to come to a complete stop. If I instantly just like dashed to the other side of the room and I had a scarf on, if I just was like here on frame one and I'm, on, I'm over here on frame two, that scarf is still gonna be over there and it's gonna like slowly come and flow because like my momentum doesn't necessarily, and like what I'm made of, doesn't necessarily, isn't the same material that the scarf is made of. So just kind of considering those things when you're designing actions or, or things in the, in the environment. So this is me kind of comparing to uh, like the 2D animation and what they were doing in the pixel art era with very limited tool set. And they kind of forgot some of that. Like they're getting a lot of the motion down, but the tools of 3D are still evolving so that this is changing. But especially in early 3D, that's from Street Fighter 4. Same thing, it's like the, the flash is there, the feedback's there, but there's a big difference between the, the, emo the like dynamic emotion of what's happening. Uh, not just in her facial expressions, but that's kind of like, where, where are things clear? Uh, yeah, so like, and I think the follow through changes too. Like there's no, this doesn't look as powerful because that's not moving. And, it, and those look like a totally different material than this. This looks like it could actually be a very thin, like satin kind of cloth. That looks like it could be, 
don't know, plastic? Plastic. Someone put it there. Um, so this is a, more of a technical thing, but in one of the principles of animation is arcs. And so rarely in life do things move in, in straight, rigid, robotic kind of lines. Um, and the reason is because like our base mechanics might be, like our elbows and, and our joints might move in like one or two dimensions, but generally when you start getting more of those moving at the same time, if you were to track uh, motion, it generally moves in an arc. And great for the user, it just looks more pleasing. When things kind of move in an arc between frame to frame, it just mo looks more pleasing to the player. Um, I won't talk too much about this, but the link will be in the slides. This is the principle of, um, of exaggeration. And so this is an example of, again, in Street Fighter, the overshoot. At the frame where this, is, this attack is the most powerful, it actually overshoots where it ends up. And so just, and it happens super fast, but again, it's more of, this is where animation gets into the like, ooh, feel, like it feels like it had some impact, feels like it did something much more than just like more mechanical, like I went from here to here. If it goes out and then back, it just feels like that attack had much more impact. Um, one of my favorite things, just effects and flourishes, they really, they're kind of the, uh, the Robin to the Batman, the sidekick to the superhero. Whatever that action was, whatever that purpose was, these are the things that just kind of like come in flipping and flying and sparkling. Um, but they should always be for a purpose. They should always emphasize whatever that main action was. So again, using Smash Bros. as an example, uh, these kind of like spinning dust cloud underneath him helps to, sh again, kind of showcase the power of what he's doing. If you really, if, if you kind of remove that and just look at what he's doing, he's not moving too fast, again, because to make that action more clear. But those effects help make that action feel more powerful, feel like it has more impact, and that these characters actually exist in a digital world that, that you're interacting in. So, what time is this talk over? Uh, you have half an hour. Oh, great. Cool. All right. So, yeah. So this is a this is a very interactive slide. Looking at these characters, uh, they're all performing the same action. So, like, perhaps in the code, it might even be called the same thing. It might just be because it's moving them from one point to another. They're all doing a backwards dodge roll. Um, at some point in between this, they they're invulnerable. They can't be hit. But they're all very different characters. And, there, and the designer, the animator that came into thinking about these characters had to design, well, how does this character do that action? How does this character move in a way that, that is true, that is, in, that is congruent with the rest of uh, this character's backstory? So just kind of asking up to the group, like, who, who out of all these looks the heaviest? Is that ice or marks on there? Yeah, you can use, I did the colors just so that was easy. So if you say like so, you're, somebody said the green looks heaviest, red looks heaviest, blue. Okay, some different answers. So so why though? Yeah. So if you didn't know if you didn't know the actual like game physics, why do they look heavy? What it takes a while for for you to gain momentum to jump, right? When you roll, and when you land, it's slower than every other. Yeah. So like in the game, in the game engine, these are all just like 3D polygons. They don't weigh anything. But to the user, that's the Hillian shield. That's a master sword. He's got bombs in there. He's got arrows. He's got, he is loaded down with stuff. He's got boomerang, he's loaded down. This one's a little bit interesting. Same principle, like, so okay, so he takes a little while to gain momentum. Uh, this is Mark. He doesn't necessarily have all that, that toolkit, maybe, and especially in the context of the game, he's pretty light, but why might he be moving slower? What, what does that action kind of like feel like? What, is, what's, what does it say about like how he moves compared to everybody else? Compared to the other guys, like he doesn't walk, like, like, like he doesn't ever leave the ground. Yeah. Uh, so the other guys are like, they're out in the air and stuff. Yeah. And friction. Like there's friction? Yeah. Like liquid Yeah, so it goes to the next question. Like, who looks like they had the most training? And training is kind of a broad term, but like maybe tactical training like like that, like fencing. Who looks like they had more sword training? Uh, Link and Well, Link and Link, but in terms of training overall, it was just like, yeah, 
what you're getting is uh, uh, Why is smart? Why is smart? Is smart? Yeah. Yeah. How about just like who who looks like they're stretching the most in the morning? The black guy looks the most. <laughs> yeah. The blue. Blue. Who's gonna be stretching with his uh, back foot? Yeah. I don't know. That looks pretty flexible to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he, seems, he seems like more bunched up. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's not stretching, but he's like more bunched up. Oh yeah, I guess he's quick. like arching his back and everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, and it's also a way to kind of introduce players to these characters, to their personalities. Because if you know anything about Captain Falcon, what game is he from? F Zero. What is he acrobatic in that? Racing. No. He's racing. <laughs> yeah. So it can say a little bit like this. This kind of demands a crazy backstory of like, where was he doing all this martial arts training? <laughs> what? Okay. So here's uh, a little bit more color and personality, same kind of thing. These players are all walking, um, maybe not all in the same direction, and one guy's changing. But uh, yeah, the way that these, sorry, I guess I put these out of order. The way these characters are doing the action says a lot about who they are as a character. So now we're kind of breaking out of the, just the mechanics of talking about, like, here's some cool tips to, to think about and lenses to use when you're animating or designing. Um, now you're getting more into the nitty gritty of, like, okay, whether you design this character or somebody else is bringing it to you, you really, like, a character is really a character to be either somebody's hero or somebody's villain or like there's a purpose there for the player and if, if somebody's going to be a fan of a character that you create you really want to consider what personality do they have because right here I'm sure whether you, you meant to or not you probably have some one of these that you prefer just out of these four like one that you like a little bit more than the others or one that you don't like more than the others or one that you feel like eh, I'd never play that character or one that you're like that's who I like that looks pretty fun like, if, you, if this was a game, you probably know which, which character you'd pick first, right? Like, and that, that's really considering the user, considering the player in the experience that they came for. Why are they here, and what kind of experience are you designing for? So I put this up here just to remind, that again, like, it, it, even with all the personality um, in these actions, that they, they need to be responsive. And so, again, like, the more exaggerated you can, you can make something and really like imbue that action with personality, uh, the more readable it's going to be in a fast-paced environment. So, yeah, what what can you guys assume about, again, like, if you know who these characters are, just forget it for a second, or just maybe wait to see somebody who doesn't know these characters, what, what they might say. Um, just the way she's walking, what, what can you tell about maybe who she is as a person, as a character? Snobby. Snobby? Confident. Confident. She might be a villain. Might be a villain. Yeah, how about this guy? Uh, punk, uh, gangster, maybe? Punky, gangster? Punky, gangster? Angry. Aggressive, angry? Proud. Proud. Very, very rough, pretty even at chair of the weapon. Yeah. <laughs> so he just wants to get the job done. He's focused. He's leaning forward. He's got, he's like, all of this is in, in that, again, that silhouette. If you were to, like, just paint all of these things black, you could still see these personalities seeping through, right? Like, forget that she's wearing a fur coat, you can probably tell that it's some kind of fluffy material just by the way it moves, just by the way that it, it, it's reacting to the rest of the action. How about this? Whimsical. Whimsical? Nerve. Yeah. Silly? Alright, and how about the, the last one? Trained. Ready to fight? Trained? Very economical with his movement, he's, he's keeping loose and limber. Yeah, so like there's a lot of difference there. There's a lot that you can kind of take and, and apply to even the simplest animations. If you're doing a walk animation for a character, um, yeah, it's great to just do the, the basic mechanics of it, but then really start asking yourself those questions on the next couple passes if you have the time. Who, what, what are they doing? What's their personality? What do I want the player to, to immediately get from meeting this character, just the, even the first time? They should be able to tell. All right. So big principle in the, uh, the illusion of life that took me a while to kind of understand, especially because I, I love 2D animation, is the solid drawing principle. And these are both 2D. These are both pixel art. But just looking at them, one looks like they're taking up actual three-dimensional space in the world that they exist in. 
and one looks a little bit less so, right? I know that's kind of a high concept thing, but can you can you guys tell that? See it, but I don't know why. I guess part of the thing part. Um. Yeah, I think like for this one especially, there's a little bit darker yeah. pixelization exactly. color on the the limbs that are kind of further back in the scene. So yeah, and again, one yeah, one foot's higher. And that's, that's the kind of thing of, and especially this one's turned perfectly, and I know there's um, several different cameras in, in this um, with all of you, but like for, if this was my camera and I'm just looking this way, I look a lot more flat. It's really hard to tell like where I am, but if that same camera is right there and I even open up just a little bit, now it's a lot more readable. I look like I'm actually balanced, taking up space. There's more information, even though like, legs and feet and po pose and um, clothes and things like that, they're all little information at the end of the day. So you're, you're giving information to the user. You're showing uh, other people what, what they need to know about these characters. So um, what game is uh, this is from a pixel puzzle game called Duelist, or I think strategy, not, not necessarily puzzle, but Duelist with a Y. So another important thing is, again, going back to uh, geometry class, so I'm sorry, volume is really important. Just thinking, again, like even if, if the tools you are using are going to output a 2D thing, you should still be thinking in 3D as much as you can. Because the world that that character lives in, unless it's like Paper Mario or, again, like you're, you're very intentional about some kind of stylistic theme about the world, Generally, I think most games take place in a three-dimensional world. Even if the gameplay is 2D, even if the camera is 2D, even if the art is 2D, the game takes place in a three-dimensional world. And so it's, if you have foregrounds and backgrounds and things like that, it's good to, uh, to just consider how you're displaying the volume of those characters, of, of the shape, uh, to make everything more believable. And it, and it, it feels more realistic, even in, in something as crazy fantasy like that just feels like he's taking up space. So if somebody were to walk excuse me, behind him, um, it just feels like it makes more sense. Like you, you understand a little bit more about the depth in that scene. So this is a, another example of having that same conversation with, uh, with somebody in the, on Shara's project of, uh, I don't think this is really well done, but just quickly getting those ideas across of the underlying frame or volume of that character should still kind of maintain consistence. I don't think this necessarily does, which is why I thought it was a good example to use. Like the head changes sizes a little bit, and that, that applies even if they're just moving in one direction. If the head's kind of constantly changing, it's gonna, that's gonna say something completely different because it includes maybe information you didn't mean to give to the player um, in what you were doing. So some key tips would be, like remember what the, uh, the like landmark things about that character. If it's Mario, maybe it's his mustache. If it's Crash Bandicoot, maybe it's his gloves. Maybe there's things that help the player's eyes track and understand that even in that two-dimensional plane um, that the camera is creating, that like when things pass in front or things pass behind, there's still some kind of information for the player to help them understand what's happening in, in the game world three-dimensional space. So. All right, so when I say technical, I'm talking about my last thing called like screen shake. This is not, excuse me, this is not necessarily somebody, something an animator with a pen or a stylus makes in a game. This is something where the programmers, the developers come in to really work with the creative team uh, to, to help make things feel more like a believable world. So again, the animation here, the visual animation here is this thing exploding and the little minus two showing up. But all this vibration is happening with the game engine camera to help help kind of support uh, this sprite animation. So there's several other things that kind of fall in that like programming animation uh, category. And so one of them, is, especially in fighting games, it's hit stop and hit stun. I'm going to go on a little rant real quick to say you guys are making great games, but if you want it to really feel like a good digital experience for the person playing with it, you kind of got to make an effort to make sure that the, the game feels like a real place, that, that 
that wall of uh, believability, wall of believability, wall of uh, unbelievability. Yeah, yeah, the wall of disbelief. Of dis suspension, of suspension of disbelief. Thank you, Omar. The, the suspension of disbelief is constantly there, and little things, uh, little technical things, are really the the key to making sure that the game stays believable to the player, that stays engaging to the player. So I would say the, uh, excuse me. So this is an example of two terms, hit stun and hit stop. They come from the fighting game community. Um, at the beginning, you could tell, again, isolated. If you were to see this in the in the in game or the animation editor window, and it's just the character doing the punches or whatever, they're going to just go through normally. It's just going to the animator designed them to be at that frame rate, at that speed, and it's going to be constant all the time. Once they're in the engine, though. There's another little code running that as soon as the impact happens, as soon as that, that uh, collision turns true, it's saying, hey, stop everything. Slow everything down for a second. That helps things read, helps it feel more like an impact happened. Um, and especially in a game that's so fast-paced, there's feedback happening. If you're the person hitting somebody else in a game like this, it feels good. Like, you get that little, it's a stressful situation. You're fighting somebody. That little moment of pause is a is the reward of like, oh, sweet, all right, cool, I, I landed that. If you're the guy getting hit, you're like, ooh, I messed up. That's feedback. That's saying, hey, whatever you were doing when you got hit, you probably, should, you can't do that next. In that circumstance, you can't do that again. Um, so this is another really clear example of somebody in like the debug mode of uh, Smash Brothers Brawl. <laughs> so this is a perfect example of like, there's effects happening when the hit occurs, but like, it pauses his entire action. It pause. It's it like freezes them on the frame of that exact input. Which again, going back to an earlier principle, that stance, that more the look how exaggerated Marth's stance is when he's swinging that sword. The moment it pauses, it's that whole thing looks awesome. You can take a snapshot and put that up on the wall and be like, yeah, that's cool. Um, same thing. When it doesn't hit anything, it's the normal regular speed. So this isn't fighting games, but I would say experiment with this. Think creatively about how you can use this in the game that you're designing. Is something, is somebody interacting with something? Can other things kind of stop in the stage to, to allow, uh, to showcase whatever it is you want the player to really feel in that moment? Um, I, I have a question. There's two really obviously very important things in the world. Right? And I have a question for people who have actions that you need, but I want to have, in your experience, or in, I don't know if you have experience with this, is it better or is it better for entire game, like, slow, like slowing it or stopping it for a very brief period of time, or is it like that just the two animations that are flashing? Yeah, it's a really, really good question. I think it, uh, so he's asking, should you stop, like in this, should you stop everything in the background or just the two characters? I think in this example, you can see it's just stopping the two characters because the background's still kind of moving. But I think in this one, it actually stops a, like everything for a frame. Actually, I was going to say that Mario doesn't stop his animation at all. Yeah, this is because it's like the debug mode, and that's why he's green. He's basically oh. invincible. In, in the actual gameplay, this is a moment for the computer to change states to the I got hit by something. So, like, that's where if you, especially if you're, if you played Smash Brothers and you pause at the moment you hit somebody, some of the characters have the funniest <laughs> animation. Like, Ganondorf's like eyes bulge out of his head and he's like, Ugh! like, oh my gosh, I got hit. Donkey Kong like shoot out sideways. Like, those are great moments to really, sh again, showcase personality, but really exaggerate that moment happening. And that little hit pause is again, like maybe a, in a more technical programming term, like a coroutine that runs. Like, it stops everything else, show switches states, and it gives the, it works for everybody. The computer, the user, everything. Just helps everything move more smoothly and read better. Uh, another big thing that I, I wish I saw more of in any games, and I picked this is Rivals of Aether again, another Smash kind of reference, but so I apologize. Um, but this is a great example of they really considered the transitions between scenes, because and I, I think that shows more that they were thinking about the player's experience than than I think most other studios do. Like. Whether they forget, I don't think anybody does it intentionally. I think that's just how intentional they were about the experience they wanted to create. 
is that even between the character select screen and the gameplay screen, they're considering what those, what's happening in between, or the level select screen. Things happen. It still feels like the overall brand of that property. Um, and again, like, and that, what does that do for the player? What does that do when you're a game, when you're playing a game like that, and the game is kind of showing you cool stuff or, or doing more of what kind of experience um, you came for in between the scenes? It really helps helps you get deeper invested, and that's really what we what we want, right? If we're making, we're spending a lot of time creating these experiences. Why don't we want the user to be more invested, even if they're just playing it for a couple minutes? These are the little little things. Um, that take some extra work that can make a huge difference in making the experience more engaging. Um, another thing that I, I couldn't find a really good GIF of it, or GIF, or whatever you guys want to call it. <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the Mario games that's really good with that, too. I think it's Super Mario World 3. Is that the one that has like the grid map with like the hammer bro walking back and forth? Yeah. So if you look, if you just got shown that scene, there's a lot happening. The hammer bros are moving. The thing, the like levels that you can go to are flashing. There's a lot of like ambient looping animations. But when that scene opens up, it opens up either from or to Mario with like a black circle. And that what that does is it, again it shows that the designers and the developers were super considerate of the player. They probably looked at that stuff and realized. Yeah, you know, there's a lot going on. Where where do we want their eyes to go? To Mario. And what happens when, when you play that as the player? Oh, you go straight to Mario. Okay, I know where I am. I'm oriented to the world I'm in. Oh, and I can see, now I can process, I have time and, and space to process this other information. Um, here's an example of, there wasn't even an artist. In, I mean, maybe as a loose term, but there wasn't even a visual artist uh, on this project. This is all code. All the squash and stretch, all those principles of animation are happening purely in the editor, purely program programmatically. Um, and I think that's pretty cool. I mean, I'm a, I'm a visual artist, and I think that's really cool. And so I, I'd like to see more of that. I'd like to see, even in the more like technical projects, that that those principles of animation, this is why I think it's really important, and I, didn't, I said this talk wasn't just for artists and animators, it was really for everybody. Because I think these these things are kind of a collaboration between all of the teams. Uh, and the more the developers know more about how they can implement this kind of stuff and maybe make it easier, just opens up a whole realm of creativity. Of what else can we do? We're solving problems kind of on that, that base bottom floor. We can go really high because we're spending all that effort on, on more cool stuff. You're going to ask a question? What's this game called? Uh, I don't know if this game has a name. This is on, I put the, it'll be, the link will be in the slides. But there's a guy named Zach Bell who is a game maker programmer, and so he uh, he put a couple uh, free assets on the store, and I think this was one of them. It's like an action platformer or something. So, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier today about just again technically the graph editor is a great thing. If you've ever opened up like the Unity animation window and seen that like oh it says dope sheet dope sheet is selected. And then there's a graph editor next to it. What does that even mean? You open it up and like, oh, I never want to see that again. That's, that's hideous. But these are examples of, uh, in the same frame rate, the same number of frames, uh, 0 to 48, just kind of where things go if you keyframe it right in the middle. And the way these kind of curves adjust the feel of how things happen. And that really matters, again, in that bigger, larger question of orienting the player, giving the player feedback. Where did I come from? Where am I now, and where am I going? In the littlest actions to the, the whole scene, the whole game. Where, where am I now, uh, where did I come from, and where am I going? And this is more of filling in the blanks of technically, well, how did I get there? Like, how fast did I go? Where was I kind of slowing down, or was I coming in super fast? Um, you can even adjust these to where, like, it, if this curve kind of bent down here a little bit, it would move back and then kind of rubber band. So you can get a lot of cool effects just messing with keyframes and the, and the graph editor. Uh, so I encourage you to, to experiment with this kind of stuff and, and see, does it help the motion at all? If you're making buttons, if you're making UI kind of stuff, same thing. Experiment with the graph editor a little bit and see if, if you can make the, the interactions and the animation more dynamic. All right, another awesome thing. Just fun. 
a reason to get technical with animation is to provide more fun for the for the player. The example of like if you've ever played Super Smash Brothers Melee, well one, if somebody's just playing with the C stick on the joy on the GameCube controller, uh, it just rotates the screen like that. Like that's just cool. And again, it helps it's a totally 2D menu experience, but it just there's something else to play with. Okay, whoa, hold on. It's not just fun, it actually has a technical reason to be there. If your controller is plugged in with one of the joysticks like up or the C stick up, and again, what, what's what's the first word in the that brothers series? The uh, brothers brawl, brothers melee, super smash. Yeah, smash is a huge part of Smash Brothers. They intentionally said, what does the C stick do on a on the Smash Brothers game? Smash attack. It does the key thing that they knew that they wanted the players to do. A smash attack. When, Yeah, you can do it with the joystick, but the, the C-stick is an instant, easy, accessible way of doing a complex action. If you have the C-stick when you first plug in a GameCube controller, kind of accidentally tilted, maybe it's upside down on the ground, and it's tilted, so in, in terms of like the editor, the value isn't zero, it's some other value. When you get to this character select screen, it's going to already be tilted. And it's already going to say, like, whoa, feedback. Something's amiss. Something's wrong. Oh, well, I can. And then other players can kind of mess with it a little bit. And then you can unplug the controls, plug them back in, and then it resets itself. So, like, not only is it just cool, it also serves a, a, a purpose. But I would say all of that is considering, well, what's the player's experience? What's best for the player? What's best for the brand of the, the product that we're working on? So I say all this because animation, in, especially in games, is only going to be as good as the implementation. And you might be asking, well, why does that matter? I will tell you. It matters because the collaboration between the animators, the artists, and the people uh, actually coding and programming the game, and especially if that's you, that's two very different sides of the brain. That's two very different problems to consider and solve. And it's really important to kind of collaborate. So if you, if you are the sole indie developer, I would encourage you to just kind of make sure you're separating those times and taking notes of like, okay, I'm thinking from the top-down player perspective. Okay, I'm thinking from the mechanical, um, and like in a separate time, thinking from the more mechanical, how can I implement this thing? Uh, but these are examples of, again, like presentation map. The, this would be great, like I love After Effects. I love making things in like a, a compositing program like that. And I could do this super easy. But to actually have this work in a game, if this was all one big animation, it's one, probably crazy expensive on the, the memory to implement that. And two, again, going back to that hit stop thing, when, I, when he gets the power up, the whole game kind of pauses to allow this other sequence of events to happen. And I would ask you, like, have any of you played Jetpack Joyride? Yeah, how does that feel when you get a power up? Powerful. Powerful. Yeah, you have a question? I'm happy. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so, and then I would also say it goes into immersion too. Like, really, how you implement it can do a lot for the entire experience. It's ridiculous fishing. The guy's holding a phone, but you're also holding the phone. If you're playing ridiculous fishing, you're holding a phone. So, when you hit the menu, it kind of comes up and it like mirrors the guy holding the phone in the game. So, it's just, it doesn't really make a lot of sense because it's like, whoa, he's in the back and then I'm, but at the same time, it just feels good. Just like give give your players some credit that uh, that they they want a certain experience. They they like to be immersed in playing your game. Uh, another great example of just composition and, and kind of implementing stuff. This is a game called Flint Hook. But once you get to the uh, treasure chest and like all the stuff flies out, has a little moment. This is at the end of a level. You can just mash X to break this shell. And so at the if you've ever played this game, it's cra it can get crazy stressful. It's pretty difficult, and there's a lot going on, a lot to consider. This is just like one of those like dumb, fun moments of, I'm just going to mash the button, I broke this over, and like, yay, treasure. I, and like, and so there, it's, I just found it interesting because they're stacking it. Like, you already opened the chest. Oh, now, but now I'm opening the real thing. And it's just kind of cool. It, just, it makes you feel like, yeah, sweet, I did that. Uh, another e super easy way of saying it is like tutorials, especially with touch games. If you have, 
There's so many different ways of input now that if you're just kind of showing them what they should be doing, there's a little hand here. You can just kind of show rather than tell, like lots of text menus and all that. Well, one, thinking about it from the, the cost side, how are you going to translate all that if you want it to be in other languages? Hand, I think most most uh, people understand like what, like any, any language can kind of understand like, oh, I can't read that, but I can do that. And kids are going to understand that too. Yeah, especially again, kindergartners and uh, and grandparents. Like, if they can't read it, maybe they can't see it. Accessibility makes it more accessible. All right. So the last, I'm going to breeze through these. And if you have questions about it, I'd love to, to talk about it. But this is more of if you're hiring animators or you're an animator trying to be hired, an artist trying to be hired. This whole section is just about um, things to consider. So one, know exactly what you're hiring for. There's, and I think an most artists, most creative people, like they love experimenting into different things, but generally they're gonna have one thing that they're super passionate about. So even if they're doing, like, because I've known people that are great musicians, but they're also fantastic animators. Whoa, I, I hired for the musician, but they also have this other skill set that's awesome, and they want to do more of it. Um, so just these are all the kind of different types of animation. And uh, the principles are all the same, which is good. Some of the mechanics and some of the tools can vary, but they're generally the same. Um, but, but again, like they're, they can be very different things. And know know what, sh what you're looking for. And if you're a student trying to be an artist or animator, know, kind of have an idea. Again, you don't have to like, set yourself into one thing, but have an idea of what you're interested in or what you want to try. So biggest thing, and I wish I had more time to go over this slide, but speak the same language. I think if there's one thing, I've said one thing several times, so now there's a bunch of one things. But, <laughs> Uh, getting concrete vocabulary for stuff like theme, mood, feel. This is great, again, for musicians. I found it's been super helpful to have set vocabularies where we have long conversations about, well, what does it actually mean for it to feel dark or to feel happy? Things like that. Getting So there's a keyword now that I can say happy, and we both have the same definition about what that actually means. What, what practical things can we do to make the experience more happy? Um, technical ground rules, what's the frame rate? Uh, there's game frame rate, like how fast the game engine is actually running, but then there's frame rates for animation. The, the more frames something is, the smoother it's going to be. Less frames something is, the, the more quick and hard it will feel. But that works for stuff like pixel art. 3D, probably going to be like 30 to, to 60 frames. Um, deliverables, like what, what do you actually need? And I, again, I say this as like hiring animators, but this is stuff that if you're trying to get hired, you, these are the questions you want to ask them. What deliverables do you need? What, am I giving an image sequence? Am I giving uh, in-engine kind of code? Am I giving getting a sprite sheet? Uh, and then the last thing, just collaborate often. I think the biggest way to kind of get out of our own bubble of what our industry is or whatever our, our skill set is and how we can expand that and grow, games are super collaborative. There's art happening. There's visual art happening, there's music happening, there's interactivity happening, there's programming happening, and there's a lot of people trying to push the boundaries of their own little uh, industry in, in that experience too. So it's really important to kind of go, go talk to the other people and talk about like, oh, you did that, that's really cool. How did you do that? How does that work? If you're, I know a lot of the programming stuff can make like artists head hurt, but go talk about it, just understand more, because then it can help you think more creatively you saw Ryan and Amy's talk yesterday, it's kind of what she was talking about writing. She's, she's a storyteller, but learning more about programming helped her think in a way that was more realistic for them to actually program and stuff. Um, I would say the number one thing I could recommend to everybody is to just start storyboarding. Just like the, the first, uh, one of the first slides I showed, and the reason why I said like I encourage you guys to do it if you have ideas for your own game, just storyboard. And this is like DreamWorks quality. Like all the artists at DreamWorks are super crazy good and super professional. But they, so this is pretty high quality even for their low fidelity stuff. But I would say stick figures work too. Because again, like you, when you're starting here, you're not thinking so much about the technical way to get here. You're thinking about what the user experience is here, but you're problem solving here. That's why it's good to be in black and white, good to think about all the, those topics I went over of like, what should they be feeling? Where did they come from? What are they doing? Where are they going? Those are the things that are super important to really give context uh, and, and meaning to it. 
Yep, so start with the lowest fidelity first, even if it's like a Word doc or a spreadsheet, just solving those problems. That's the first step. So wrap up, that's frame rate. This is kind of like technically where, where did it go, where is it going? Is it cycling back into itself or is it going back into a, a new animation sequence? Failure to plan is bad. I'll, I'll post all these later, I'm just gonna breeze through the, the last slide. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to, to talk to you um, either at lunch or during the break. But yeah, just plan. The biggest way not to, to fail is to really have some kind of an idea, because then just if you were in Thomas's talk, just the it's not it's not failure, it's just you learn ways that it didn't work. <laughs> Do research. I think this is another big thing about if you're really trying to create a brand um, and have a successful one at that, just knowing really definitively who is this for? What is this? If it's something that already exists, like Angry Birds or Darkest Dungeon, those are two very different things. The kind of, the way things move and how things, the feeling that people are getting are totally different. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, the context questions, where did I come from, where am I now, where am I going? That should be relevant for you as the, the artist, the animator, the programmer, but also for the user, for the player. Where, what is this? Um, design system, that's a big topic, but just thinking more, this is a kind of a way for a team to collaborate on how to, to create a more branded system of how to kind of keep track of those things. That if, if maybe every button has the same easing, so that's a consistent brand experience across all devices, whether it's like the web, whether it's the, the game itself, or an app, or something like that. So thank you, that was, that was my talk. <laughs> big Boss says thank you as well. My name is Peter Benoit, uh, and yeah, you can find me at uh, Twitter, Facebook. I like streaming stuff on Twitch, but I'm pretty new to the CGDC group on, on Facebook. Like, I posted some stuff, but this has been a great experience for me, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, and yeah, I'd love to talk to you more if you guys have cool projects or just want to ask questions. I'll be available after. So, thank you very much. And if anybody would like an airhead, Finish. Finish. Come on. No, it just it's Yeah, go for it. I don't understand why this isn't. Why won't it finish? That's so effing annoying. I want it finished. If you drink this one, then you uh, I do like yeah. writing a story. Yeah. Between the two of them, I decided on this one because I've done it. Wow, I just want to like hit this thing now. Come on.
won't finish for me, and I don't know why. Yeah,